Hello, and welcome to the Say Yes to Holiness podcast. I'm Christina Simmons, your host, and today I am so excited. I have a marvelous and really a surprise guest, uh, Sister Alicia Torres of the Franciscans of Eucharist of Chicago. And for those of you who don't know her, I'm going to let her kind of introduce herself a little bit and give a little bit of background. But first, welcome to the show, Sister. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, Christina. Thanks for your invitation. Uh, it, it's awesome, uh, particularly because of the work that you're doing right now. But before we jump into that, because the work is associated with the National Eucharistic Revival, I wanted, you know, for those listeners who might not have come across you in, uh, in your various uh, forms on uh, online and also uh, previously on TV, uh, what is it about your journey? Some, you know, share some highlights from your faith that really have helped you uh, go about what you're doing today. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, oftentimes we wonder about the role of the family in our in our journey of discipleship. And I was really blessed to have parents who took us to Sunday mass, and we at least would pray, you know, grace before meals, and then we would often pray the family rosary. My mom homeschooled me for a number of years, and she was my primary educator in the faith. So I'm very grateful to my family. And as I, you know, moved on through high school and into college, it was an opportunity for me to choose to continue to practice my faith. And so as often as I could, I went to daily mass. I was on a campus of a Jesuit university, and we were really fortunate at the time to have a late night mass, which was really accessible, 10 p.m., finish your studying and the day with the holy sacrifice of the mass. And I think it was, you know, between that choice and my commitment to the pro-life movement, just being really active in that, where the Lord opened my heart to his call to religious life. Um, of course, like many of us, it was not the most welcome call initially. I was actually really into it, but then I was like, wait a minute, that means I can't get married and have a family like I always mm -hmm. planned. You know, but as I struggled and the Lord, you know, he's so gracious and he wants us to respond freely in love because love can only be free. Um, and as I responded and he helped me with his grace, I was able to say yes and very grateful to God. He worked a great miracle in my life because I had over $94,000 of student loan debt. And within a year and a half, um, people all over the country heard my story. I was running distance races and sent him pledges and all that debt was paid off. Um, mm. And I was able to enter a novitiate in 2010 and profess my final vows in 2015. So I'm getting on to nine years in final vows in religious life. And my community serves on the west side of Chicago. We serve in a very poor neighborhood. We offer, you know, basic needs like food and clothing, but we also have opportunities for the community to come together for prayer and meals. We also help teach religion in poor Catholic schools, and we do a lot of evangelization, especially through retreat work with youth and college students. Mm. And it's so awesome. Uh, your journey is is a little similar to my own in that I went to Marquette right up the road in Milwaukee uh, to a good Jesuit school. Um, and uh, I also had that experience of being able to go to late night mass. But it was in college that our Lord called me to that really first conversion. Um, and that's where I became Catholic. Um, and uh, so I I, uh, I definitely can identify also with the distance races. Um, I've done Ironman triathlons and I did a marathon in December. And so um, it is, uh, but it's beautiful that the entire body of the church was able to respond in order to help you respond to your call. And I think we forget the importance of the entire church for our individual journeys. Um, and so, so often it's like me and God, um, but it's only in the context of community that we're able to respond. And I think that really leads us into talking about the Eucharistic revival of what's going on, because this is about the whole church. But could you share a little bit about that? And then specifically, what's been keeping you busy in regards to that uh, with the Eucharistic revival the last couple of years? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the National Eucharistic Revival is really a movement that our bishops have responded to the Holy Spirit inspire. Um, and we've been living this revival for the better part of two years now. We began in June 2022 on the Corpus Christi Sunday weekend. Mm -hmm. And that was the first year was a year of diocesan revival. And then we in 2023 moved into a year of parish revival. And we are moving quickly um, to the impending and approaching National Eucharistic Congress in July. 
However, leading up to that Congress just yesterday, Pentecost Sunday, from four different areas of our country, our National Eucharistic Pilgrimage launched over 6,500 miles combined um, that the pilgrims will be walking. From our research, we are fairly certain it may be the longest Eucharistic procession in Catholic Church history, which is really mm -hmm. exciting. But what's even more exciting is that not only has God inspired this, but that the Lord has also provided people to respond so that we could have a very, very public witness to our belief in the real presence, to the primacy of the holy sacrifice of the mass and the life of a Catholic, and the peace and the joy that a relationship with Jesus brings. Mm -hmm. uh, it it, uh, it gives me chills, literally. Um, you know, I'm in the Diocese of Birmingham, as, as we were talking beforehand, and the pilgrimage is going to be coming through uh, next month, and I'm excited. But as kind of like a, a capping off of our year, um, we as an entire parish are going to be pilgrimaging down to the shrine. Uh, we're blessed uh, to have the shrine of the most blessed sacrament here in our diocese, and we're going to be spending that day in adoration and a, you know and a healing mass and spending time of course with our lady as well um but one of the big things that i kind of came to know you through was your work as the editor for the heart of the revival newsletter that um that the national eucharistic revival has going on and then of course also your pulse youtube series um and you know, the newsletter is a little bit more traditional in the sense of how church has been communicating, but jumping into the YouTube space has not been. Um, could you share a little bit about what kind of prompted that for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was really blessed and surprised to be invited to be part of the executive team for the mm -hmm. National Eucharistic Revival. So we first gathered in the summer of 2021 with Bishop Cousins up in St. Paul. And it was like a nation beginning, right? Um, but the bishops were in support of this revival. So it was year zero. Um, and in that time, I actually was blessed to work with Father Jorge Torres, who is now the director of the um, Office for Vocations and Clergy and Consecrated Life at the USCCB. And together with some other collaborators, we launched the National Eucharistic Preachers Corps. So we have over 50 religious and diocesan priests who went ahead, in a sense, to all of the dioceses around the country to preach revival. And then from there, once that was in good place, I was asked to pivot over to the newsletter team um, and then eventually took on leading that. And we've been very blessed, actually. Many of our volunteers, it's a complete volunteer editorial team, are from religious communities from around the country. And it's been really mm -hmm. a joy to work with other religious, uh, as well as some wonderful lay people on the newsletter. And you know, we were just watching our numbers and we knew very clearly that the newsletter was really reaching a crowd over 50 to 60 years old and we really need to engage with young people and so that was what really impelled the move over to YouTube um, which has been really exciting and you know we're seeing more engagement with young people there recently our data is showing us that we have a fair number of viewers now who are under 50 even under 40 and in their 30s and mm -hmm. late 20s and that was really our hope and really like late 20s into 40 is the primary mm -hmm. YouTube population. So we're kind of finally reaching our audience that we were aiming for. Um, you know, so that's been good. And I think it's a real testimony to how in the church, like the popes have told us over the recent decades, you know, you have to be able to read the signs of the times. Mm -hmm. And it might not be convenient to do something like produce a weekly YouTube video but it reaches people that we're not reading, reaching with the written word. And perhaps that'll stoke a desire to then go a little bit deeper with articles and catechesis. Um, but if we can't reach people where they're at, then we're actually not evangelizing because you have to meet people where they are and then accompany them in that journey closer to Christ or for a first encounter if they haven't had one. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And you bring up such a, a beautiful point about meeting people where they are. And, um, you know, and, and that national Emmaus moment is kind of how you guys have been describing the pilgrimage. And I, I am excited because I think that that's really where most people are going to encounter the Eucharistic revival in, in the moment as, as the pilgrimage is coming through. Um, and so often we neglect to go to where people are. We expect people to come to us. And that's not what Jesus did. 
Um, and so we got to get out of our comfort zones and, and to go out. And that kind of leads us into, we have the, the big Congress coming up in July, of course, the 17th to 21st in Indianapolis, but we, there's going to be a year of mission afterwards. Right. And I kind of want to, you know, uh, it's going to be, I know it's going to be a grand celebration in Indianapolis, but kind of moving and looking forward that year of mission, you know, they've been four pillars kind of in preparation before the Congress, but there's going to be, you know, kind of new ones, new guidelines, new, new uh, focuses for us as we move forward that year of mission. Could you speak about those a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So we're really, really grateful to the Holy Spirit as he continues to inspire and the teams to continue to discern, you know, what is God will and what is he, God's will and what is he inviting the church into in the United States? So within the next couple of months, I don't know the exact publication date, there will be a, a book on Eucharistic missionaries that um, Bishop Cousins and the executive director of the Congress, Tim Glomkowski, wrote together. And in this book, it'll really feature these four pillars that you just referred, referred to, Christina, but they'll be accessible to people outside the book as well. And what we're talking about is Eucharistic encounter, Eucharistic identity, Eucharistic friendship, and then Eucharistic mission. So kind of borrowing from something that's really popular in the world of forming seminarians, relationship, identity, mission. So our identity comes from our relationship with God, right? And it's through that encounter with the person of Jesus Christ at the mass and in our Eucharistic devotions that we deepen and realizing what does it mean to be made in God's image and likeness? So then our identity is clarified. We don't create our identity. It's given to us by God. We're created in his image and likeness as male or female. You know, and that's something that our culture is really struggling with right now. How can we respond to the struggle in a positive way, not condemning people, but inviting them to think differently, which is a whole other topic of conversation <laughs> with um, the loss of the sacramental worldview. And then Eucharistic friendship. You know, what does it mean? or not Eucharistic friendship, Eucharistic life in which friendship is a part of that. What does it mean to live rooted in the awareness that my identity, the wellspring of my identity is the Eucharist, Jesus Christ is a revelation of the son of God who leads us into relationship with the father through the Holy Spirit. Um, so what does my everyday life look like? You know, a lot of times we hear that ending of, of the mass, which is often go, the mass is ended. We say, thanks be to God, but it's not like, oh, thank God it's over. <laughs> like, <laughs> thanks be to God, you're sending me on mission, but I have to live a life consistent with what I just did in the last hour, how I, as a member of the assembly, allowed myself to be in communion with the priests as they offered the sacrifice and I offered myself as best as I could. And so from living that consistent Eucharistic life, we have that foundation to then go out on mission. And of course, you know, we remember the words of, of St. Mother Teresa, find your own Calcutta. You know, oftentimes the mission begins in our own home, in our neighborhood, in our workplace. And, and that really prepares us if and when God calls us to a mission even beyond those boundaries into the peripheries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think so often we will negate our own mission because of just exactly as you were saying, because we are not clear on our identity of who it is that we are as beloved adopted sons and daughters of our Lord and how he has empowered us. I mean, we, we just celebrated Pentecost then the Holy Spirit and it's, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to live that Eucharistic life that you were talking about. I'm super excited uh, to be able to see how it unfolds in, in the year ahead and the fruits that will come. Um, but I want to, you know, just take a, a moment, you know, about, in addition, you know, we have the Congress, we got the pilgrimage. These are all things that, you know, people kind of need to leave their homes, you know, to go, you know, and to do. Um, but what might be some ways that individuals or even parishes might be able to participate in the Eucharistic revival? Mm -hmm. And it's something of they're not having traveled to Indianapolis and they're not having to, to go and track down where the pilgrimage route is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we certainly encourage people as much as they're able to participate mm -hmm. in the pilgrimage or to go to the Congress. We know it's a big sacrifice for many people. Um, and we also know that God is inviting us to go. So as much as we can to be physically present is special and important. And we also believe in the communion of the saints, right? And so mm -hmm. we're always united as the body of Christ with one another. And there's a spiritual bond that we share through Christ our head. And so to be able to allow Jesus in the Eucharist to continue to be the center of our lives. 
I have been really encouraging and trying to forward continually throughout the revival, this notion of, of praying the mass and being really present, just as Jesus is truly present to us in the word, in the pre presider, the priest, in the assembly, and in a most special way in the Eucharist. Um, and praying the mass is, I think, a lifelong um, a journey of a deepening relationship mm -hmm. with God. And you know, when it comes to the parish community, Christina, I think the church in the United States is really accustomed to being offered programs or, you know, directed by their diocese mm -hmm. to do things. And something that's been different about the Eucharistic Revival is that we've tried to communicate and encourage local communities to discern what is it that my community needs to take a next step in being a Eucharistically centered community or to have a Eucharistic culture. And at the heart of a Eucharistic culture is both recognizing the sacrifice of Christ and then seeing every day I too, like Jesus, can lay myself down in love for my brothers and sisters. You know, so there's a notion of self gift. And we know the Vatican Council has taught us that we don't know who we truly are until we can make a gift of ourselves. We actually discover our identity through that. You know, so even that relationship with God, he reveals himself to us, but he also reveals us to ourselves as we grow in that intimacy. You know, so for some parishes, it might be having a holy hour for the first time and starting where you're going to be able to grow. So it doesn't mean every day or even every week, but maybe just a monthly holy hour, right? Mm -hmm. For some parishes, maybe they already have adoration and it. it's a small group study. For some parishes, maybe that's happening, but they're not really stretching themselves outside of their parish family and God is inviting them to do some service, but always keeping it connected with the Eucharist, right? We have in our church, the beautiful tradition of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy mm -hmm. across the country during the Eucharistic pilgrimage. Every Saturday, there'll be a morning or a day of service here in our local church. I'm in Chicago. We're calling it morning of service and adoration, and we'll have sites all over the archdiocese, and many of those will also host Eucharistic adoration simultaneously, not mm. only um, to show the connection between our relationship with Christ and the Eucharist and being sent on mission with him, but also because many Catholics can't physically participate in service, but they can certainly intercede and mm. practice the spiritual works of mercy before the Blessed Sacrament, whether they're physically in the church or through a live stream opportunity. Mm. So I think there's a lot of ways, Christina, but I think that the Holy Spirit is asking us right now to be stretched a little bit and to, to learn how to listen more deeply and discern what does God want for St. Mary Parish or St. Joseph outreach to the poor. Like it's it's different for everyone, but there's that common Eucharistic um, culture that the Lord wants to continue to build up. Oh, I mean, it, it, it's all of what is going on uh, amongst the revival and the what you are speaking of, of you know, to stretch, you know, and to allow the Holy Spirit to, to direct us so that we can discern together, um, you know, just enlivens and, you know, quickens my own heart um, uh, about the, the possibilities. And, you know, I can, I can think of, you know, some things that I, I hope will come, but what are some long-term fruits that have been expressed? I know as the executive committee, and then also I know as the bishops have been doing, doing this work, but what might be some long-term fruits? Of course, it's all the Holy Spirit, but mm -hmm. what, what are some hopes that, uh, that we have for this entire three years and beyond? <laughs> yeah, you know, we've also always said from the beginning that the vision of the National Eucharistic Revival is to have um, a whole company of Catholics who've been converted, healed, formed, united, and sent out on mission with Christ Jesus for the life of the world. Because so that's our vision. And the way that that happens is through authentic encounter with the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. It's no secret that an overwhelming minority of Catholics darken the doorways of our churches for Sunday mass. You know, where mm -hmm. um, some, one study indicated that after the pandemic, in-person mass attendance is down from 20 to 13% on any given weekend throughout the church. Now there's also good news because across the country, we saw a tremendous increase in men and women coming into the church this Easter. Mm -hmm. um, in the diocese of Grand Rapids alone, there were 350 new Catholics. Mm -hmm. Up at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Newman Center, they had 62 join mm -hmm. the church. So, you know, the Holy Spirit is on the move. And I think that's important to remember is that God never abandons his people. But what we really deeply desire is to see Catholics in relationship with Jesus in the Eucharist, 
that the nourishment of their lives comes from the source and summit of our Christian life, which is the mass, and that we have a sense of being sent forth, but drawn back. So there'll be a, a new invitation that'll be, in a sense, revealed at the Eucharistic Congress. I don't want to speak too much of it now, mm -hmm. but um, not just the Congress, but for the whole church, a, a very well-discerned model for how to be on mission to one person and be with that person along their journey back to the sacramental life. And I think that that, that, that initiative has the profound possibility of bearing tremendous fruit um, so I look forward to, as we unveil that, and I pray that people's hearts are open to that um, mm -hmm. because it'll be very unique, not quite anything like that will have happened on this large stage of invitation. Uh, that, that would be definitely um, hopes and uh, many prayers fulfilled um, you know, with, with that going on. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask, even though, um, you know, a lot of people might be like, oh, well, Sister Lisa, she's a religious sister, so this is like her thing, right? Mm -hmm. But um, all of us, regardless of our vocation, you know, be it married, single, be it religious or, or priestly, um, we all have challenges and, you know, and then, you know, consolations along the way. What, what, might be a couple that you might be able to share about your own spiritual journey in correlation to the work that you've been doing with the Eucharistic Revival? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, for me, um, our religious community, like so many religious communities, you know, we're called to a corporate apostolate. And so even just working for the revival, it's not outside of our apostolic work, but it's not here with my sisters and, you know, brothers mm -hmm. in, in Christ and religious life. So, you know, that's a little bit of, of a hard thing. Um, and of course, like it's a temporary mission, it won't be forever. Um, and I think the other, the other biggest challenge that I've experienced, well, there's always a challenge of humans imperfect communi imperfect communication, <laughs> um, myself included, but then also it's just always been kind of like Father Jorge said in the beginning, um, we're kind of like building the plane as we fly it, you know? Wow. So it's always felt like we're, we just are like a short, um, short in time. So that's been, it's been a challenge, but there's also been some really, really beautiful creativity that's been impelled by that. And God has always opened the doors that needed to be open and provided the resources that we needed. Um, as far as, you know, blessings, I mean, it's just been a profoundly humbling thing to, to serve our church, to serve our bishops, to see the integrity and the authenticity of our bishops, which a lot of people don't have the opportunity to see firsthand where we're often, you know, not a, not abashed to give our opinions about the bishops, perhaps criticize them, whether it's charitably or uncharitably, and our priests as well. But, you know, I have to be honest with you, I had the opportunity to be in Baltimore for the General Assembly last fall where, you know, over 250 bishops came together as they, ought, they do twice a year. And um, goodness, I was at an early mass, 630, and just being there, the overwhelming, tremendous majority at Mass, of course, for bishops, and sensing that spirit of prayer and their humility before our Eucharistic Lord was profoundly moving. And if I could say anything, I, could, I would say to people, you know, we are called to pray for our bishops and our priests to be grateful. Without them, we'd have no Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And we are living in a very challenging time, no matter what your institution is, when it comes to leadership and governance. Mm -hmm. The people are not inclined to want to follow a leader. Everyone wants to be their own leader, but that's not how the human family works. Um, mm -hmm. So just to see the goodness of our bishops and to see the fruitfulness of the Eucharistic Revival, whether it's in really small town stories or just big things like launching a 6,500 mile pilgrimage mm -hmm. from coast to coast, north and south. I mean, that just hasn't happened ever. And to see that we're going to have a Eucharistic Congress, the 10th National Eucharistic Congress in our country in like less than two months. Mm -hmm. like, that's mind blowing. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, definitely. Um, I, I think you bring up such a, a beautiful and important point and just want to highlight it about the, the need for us to be praying for our leadership and our, our bishops and our priests um, in, in a particular way 
praying for us to be obedient, even when we disagree, um, and to trust that the Holy Spirit, which which he is, is in the midst of everything, and that God already knows and has already accounted for what is going on, and for us to trust and to know that he's going as a people, we are his people, and as you said earlier, he, he won't abandon us, he hasn't abandoned us, um, but, but that prayer is, is so very important. Um, so I, I wanted to, to ask, um, you know, on, on a personal level, what has been one idea or habit or practice for you that's really been key for you to live out that life that God created you for on your own journey towards, towards holiness? Yeah, you know, for me personally, and I, I think it's very important in our Franciscan charism, um, St. Francis give us this profound model of not just initial, but lifelong conversion. You know, uh, one of the formators way back when I had classes at the seminary would tell the men, you're not a done muffin, <laughs> you know, but oftentimes we think that we are. Um, another priest once said, when you're a novitiate, um, you think that you're the solution. And when you make vows, you become part of the problem. You know, so we, we tend to have a, a greater impression of ourselves than is true. However, we also, with that public face, often feel incredible lack of worth. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, it's been this constant journey of remembering that I'm a poor sinner, but that's not the end of the story. I'm a poor sinner that's completely loved by God. Mm -hmm. And I'm on this journey, not only of conversion, but also of healing, you know, parts of my own heart that have been affected by my history, by my story that need the touch of Jesus in a particular way. And every step I take on that journey of conversion and healing is, is centered on the Eucharist, my encounter, my relationship with Christ there. You know, and as a Franciscan, you know, we really focus on how that vision, that seeing of Jesus in the Eucharist helps us to see him in one another, similar to what Mother Teresa told her sisters, if you can't see Jesus in the Eucharist, you can't see him in the poor. And this is why St. Francis, he was a profoundly Eucharistic saint. Most people don't know that. His love for Jesus in the Eucharist was what helped him to embrace a leper and to just stay among those who were the downcast of society at his time. Yeah. No, I, I've been blessed in that my husband is a secular Franciscan. And in fact, he's serving as uh, the his fraternity minister right now. Um, and he, you know, at, at he has stage four lung cancer. Um, and uh, but it's something of where he always shares the story. And when people say, how can we pray for you? Because it's it's treatable, but it, it's it's not curable um, and, and because it's spread, you know, throughout. And he says, pray that I have perfect joy, mm -hmm. you know, that I have the perfect joy to accept whatever it is that is God's will, you know, and may it all be offered for his glory. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I've been, I have been blessed, uh, to, uh, to have St. Francis, uh, and actually, I'm kind of jealous. I joke and tell people that if I was a really jealous woman, I'd be upset that my husband really is in love with St. Clair more than he is me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm okay with that though, because uh, she's definitely a, a, a better woman than I am. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but anyway, um, I just wanted to ask one little kind of fun question. Um, you know, what, what is your favorite book or a movie or TV show, uh, you know, what, what is it that is something that uh, really is, is kind of been nourishing for you, doesn't have to be spiritually related, but really has been uplifting and has really helped you be able to continue on your own journey? Yeah, I mean, for me, my favorite book is Little Women. I think I've read it mm. like 20 times and mm -hmm. I really identify with Joe March. Um, I love to write and I love to dabble in all things creative. Um, and for me, that's been really helpful. I know everyone thinks I'm like this raging extrovert, but I'm actually a very, very high percentage introvert. Um, so to have the time, not only of course, every day to be with the Lord in prayer, but also just the quiet time, um, whether it's writing or doing something creative, of course, it doesn't happen every day. You know, we have responsibilities, but to try to have that balance, um, which no matter what your vocation is, it's a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then we have three wonderful German shepherds that are our security core 
but they really double as fantastic pets. <laughs> so oh, gotcha. I really enjoy spending time with our dogs too. Mm -hmm. oh, wonderful. And St. Francis would be so pleased by that. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, I, I can't believe that our time has already come to a close. Um, is there any final uh, words uh, that you would like to share with the audience um, you know, before we, you know, we conclude our time? Right. I just want to thank everyone for taking time to even listen to a podcast like this. It means that you're trying to take your relationship with the Lord seriously and to continue to pray for the Eucharistic revival and also ask the Holy Spirit, you know, Lord, how do you desire me to be a part of this? Because it's for the whole church, whether you're in Indianapolis or on a pilgrimage route or not, it's for the whole church and God is doing something very special. So let's ask him to help us open our hearts. Mm, beautiful. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, but uh, just before we sign off, where's the best people for people? Uh, where is the best place for people to go and to learn more? <laughs> right. If you go to eucharisticrevival.org, we have a meta navigation. So it's got the revival, the pilgrimage, and the Congress tab right there. We have a blog. We have all sorts of resources and opportunities for you on that site. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, sister, um, it has been such a joy and such a pleasure to be able to spend some time with you. Know my continued prayers for you uh, as you continue you know, this great work that you are a part of. And also for everyone who is listening out there, know my continued prayers for each of you that you may be able to do whatever it takes so that together we can tell the master of death, not today. God bless everybody.